Now, let me repeat what I said before, just in case you'd forgotten, you'd be like, I've gone too deep into the question. When you have a look at something like this, right? The further you go in mathematics, the more that the problems you encounter... <laughs> it's okay, it's alright, I can see the conversation you're in, I'm like, I don't want to stop that, but I do want to stop it. Um, the further you go into mathematics, the more you encounter problems that can be solved in many, many different ways. Many different ways. So when you look at this, I can eyeball, there's at least five different ways I could go through this. And part of like being a good mathematician is knowing which is the best way to go. Not just that I can do it many ways, but oh, I think this might be a more helpful method rather than another one. For example, hopefully some of you noticed, or you know to notice, that if you want to um, factorize this thing, right? You can, you're going to come up with, this is a cubic, you know, something times something else times something else, okay? Now hopefully one of the things you remember is that when you're coming up with these things, you don't have to guess randomly. For instance, this number down the end here, it gives you some enormous clues as to what your um, three things are going to be, right? If you can know in advance that they're giving you something which you can actually factorize, you're probably going to get some nice whole numbers here, not always but usually. Um, so a really good guess as to something which might end up giving you a factor is something that is a, uh, a multiple or divisible by five, right? Do you see that? Yeah, so you can get numbers out of that, right? However, however, when you start to put things in, right, um, one of the problems with this is it sort of requires you to use some polynomial long division. Polynomial long division is not bad. That's why we taught it to you. But as the name suggests, it's long, right? Is there some way that we can avoid it? As, as a problem solver, I'm looking at this thinking, I know I can do that, but do I have some other alternative? And the answer is I do, because of this information right in here, right? Now, this is provided to you to give you a nudge, right? You don't need this piece of information, strictly speaking, to solve it, but because you do, you can go about it using some of the knowledge you have with calculus, right? It's got a double root. So if you picture this, right? Um, what does a cubic look like in your brain? If you could picture one, what does it look like? You sort of have like this wiggly thing happening, right? So for example, you might have something like this. Now just have a look at this uh, particular polynomial I've drawn. Does this have a double root? No, it does not. It has um, three roots, one, two, three, and each one is a single root. Very good. So this is not what my polynomial looks like. My polynomial might look something more like this. Yes. See this guy here, right? It's the same kind of shape because of where I've moved it up and down. It's got a double root right there. And then you've got this other guy over here. That's a single root, okay? Now, I should point out, one of the reasons why this is important to us is it means I can use calculus on this original function. Not all cubics have stationary points. You know, see those two over there? See how they've got two stationary points each? Here's one. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one down here, okay? If you were to, exa for example, graph x cubed plus x, right? Probably when you look at that, you're like, I have no idea what that looks like uh, off the top of my head. But in fact, this does not have any stationary points and we can really easily see how, right? How would you find a stationary point? Where do stationary points like these guys, how do you find them? It's when the, it's when the derivative, it's when the derivative equals what? Zero, because that gives you that um, horizontal tangent, right? Now, in this case, the derivative is very easy to find, right? dy and dx, can you help me out? What would you do with this? 3x squared plus 1, very good. So if you wanted to find some stationary points, you'd say, well, let's just find out when that thing down the bottom, that derivative, when is it equal to zero? In other words, when is this true? Question mark. Now, I wonder if some of you can look at that and see why it immediately gives you some problems. Have a look. What would you do to start solving this guy? Yeah, let's subtract one from both sides. So that gives me this. And then what? And that's the squared number, so whatever you can put in this. Yeah, I, I might divide by three to make Rasta's point a bit more obvious. I get this, minus, negative a third. And then you're like, wait a second. This is a bit of a problem, right? I'm not supposed to be able to take square roots of negative numbers. And in this context, you can go ahead and graph it uh, in Desmos if you like. From memory, it looks something like this. So it never does this turning thing. It does kind of wobble a little bit, but it does not ever turn around and change direction, okay? 
But the wonderful thing about this, because they've told you it has a double root, you can know with certainty there will be a stationary point, right? So I need to work with this thing and get its derivative. Let's do this together. P dash, okay? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to find the derivative and then I'm going to use it along with this knowledge that there is a double root, okay? Can someone help me out? This is our function. First thing that I'm going to differentiate is this guy here. Which gives you what? You already actually told me this. Very good. 3x squared. Next term along. Plus 18x. And then the last one that I really need to worry about. Minus 21. Minus 21. Why is that the last term I really need to worry about? Because it's negative. Uh, it is negative, but why, why not worry about this guy? It's just a constant, so when I differentiate, it's gone. Okay, it just changes where you are up and down. It doesn't change your um, slant or your gradient. So here's my derivative, okay? Now, can you work with this any easier? Like, it's, it's fine, that is the derivative you've differentiated, but can I simplify it anymore? Factoring. Yeah, it's a factor of? Three. Three, so let's just take that out to the front. That leaves me with x squared plus 6x six. Six minus, seven. minus 7. Very good. Can you do anything with this? Yeah. We can, right? Can we yeah. factorize this? What are our, what's our pair of numbers? X, x minus Adds to this, multiplies to minus that. Plus seven. Minus, seven and one. minus 7 and 1 or minus 1 and 7? Plus, plus, plus 7. X minus 1. And of course, you could just expand that to check it out. So what I've done is I've differentiated, tied it up a little bit. Now I have it in a factorized form. But how can I use this? Think about all of this visual stuff that we were talking about before. What can I say about this or from this? Say it again. When is this, thank you, Sonoma, when is this zero? You can see that the derivative, p dash, will be zero at two particular values, one from here and one from here. Which ones are they? Minus seven. Negative seven or positive one. So I've got two stationary points. Two stationary points. These correspond to like this guy and this guy, right? I mean, that's just an example. These are not the actual values, right? But I know that one of these, one of these will be the double root. Can you see that? One of them has to be. How do I work out which one is the double root? I can substitute them in, right? I could do even better than that though. I can do better than that. If I substitute in to here, I can know in advance I'm looking for a particular value, right? One of these is a double root. So therefore, it should give me a factor of the original polynomial. That was, that's the whole point after all, right? So the factor theorem tells me, once I find the correct one and substitute it in, what should you expect to get? Zero. You should expect to get zero. Can you go ahead? There's, most of you are in pairs. Why don't you test out this guy? Why don't you test out that one? You've got a calculator there. Give it a go. Give it a go. Just go ahead. Give it a go. I need to see you actually do it because that's part of the... Yeah, very good. You can see it, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Say again. Two forty-three. Oh, I've just done it enough times. <laughs> I didn't intend to memorize it. I just have done it a lot of times. Okay. Now, hopefully, what you've gotten to is something like this, right? By the way, as you're doing your notes, can I just highlight this line here? Let me just put a big green thing about it. You know, Mrs. Lees and I have highlighted this multiple times, but your working is meant to, every single time, no matter what kind of question you're solving, your working is meant to produce an argument. It's something I should be able to look down this and say, oh, I can follow your line of thought, right? So rather than go from here, straight to evaluating some stuff. Did you notice we talked for a while about what our next step would be and why? And so 
our talking needs to be translated into something on your page. And that's why in this line here I say, oh, I can draw a conclusion about this derivative based on what the original question said, this connection with the double root. And you should say that. It's part of your argument. Okay, Rasen? So where is it either of x minus x is equal to Ah, I was hoping someone would ask this question. So well, I didn't address this when we were talking about it out loud, but some of you might have, uh, like Rasen, astutely noticed. I've put this word either here. I've got an x equals negative 7 or x equals 1. I've got stationary points there, right? And then I've gone ahead and said this double root that the original question talked about. It's got to be either this or that. Now, there are two options, right? Either or and. Like, it could be both of them, right? But why do I know from the original question, from the first line I wrote, how do I know that the double root can only occur at one of them and not at both? Have a think. There can only be one double root, but how do you know? I mean, to say, you know, it has a double root, I could say I have a whiteboard marker in my bag, but I actually have several, and it's still true. How do you know there can only be one? Zaki, what are you thinking? So let's have a look at this original polynomial, right? The degree, uh, or the, which is the power of the leading term, so you can just say degree. The degree is 3. That tells you there's a maximum number of roots in the whole polynomial. What's the maximum number? Three. It's equal to the degree, right? If you want more roots out of this polynomial, <coughs> excuse me, then you need to have a higher degree. If there were two double roots, you'd have to have a degree of... Four. Four, at a minimum. You could have a degree of five or six or seven, right? But here, if there's a double root, the only other thing you can have is a single root. So one has to be double, one has to be, well, this is just a regular stationary point somewhere else, okay? 